Okay, so in this video we're going to have a think about redshift and Hubble's law. Um, so we're kind of looking at cosmology here and about how the universe is changing over time and how Hubble showed this. So to understand this we have to start with the Doppler effect. And the Doppler effect is the change in frequency and wavelength of a wave in relation to an observer who is moving relative to the source. Now to think about that I want to think about dropping a stone into a pond. When you drop a stone into a pond you create waves and those waves radiate out in concentric circles and all waves do this so as I'm talking right now the sound waves from my voice are radiating across the room around the room in these concentric circles. Now this is for an object that still I've just dropped it but if that object was moving and it was moving this way I'd see this pattern happening to my ripples. Now a really common example of this is when you've got a motorbike or an ambulance or something with a siren, as it goes past, it's, it's, got, it's emitting a sound, it's emitting waves and it's moving either towards you or away from you and as it goes away from you you'll hear meow. If anyone's watched the Big Bang Theory episode where Sheldon dresses up with the Doppler effect, you'll be familiar with that sound. Or an aeroplane might do it as it goes overhead. Now what we've done is we've made these nice even wavelengths squash up or stretch out depending on which way the wave is travelling. So if the wave is moving towards you, what we see happen is that the wavelength, this is the wavelength here, lambda, the wavelength decreases it's shunted together. This means that if we know that frequency times wavelength equals wave speed, and if let's say it's sound, speed of sound staying constant and the wavelength goes down, the frequency increases. So if this is sound, we would hear a higher pitch as it comes closer towards us. As the wave goes in the opposite direction if it's moving away from us, if we're stood here, we can see that the wavelength here is definitely getting longer. We've increased the wavelength compared to here. And once again, if V equals F lambda, if we've increased the wavelength, I must decrease the frequency, which means I'm getting a lower pitch. And that's the one you generally hear. So if a motorbike goes past you, you hear meow. The pitch is going down because those waves are being stretched out. So it's the change in frequency and wavelength of a wave in relation to the observer who is moving relative to the source. So it can either be that the source is moving to you or away from you, or that you are moving towards or away from the source. Now the reason we need to know about the Doppler effect is because we can apply the Doppler effect to electromagnetic waves. And when we do that, we get redshift. And before we start, we have to know wavelengths of light. Not in exact numbers, but we need to know that the wavelength of light increases as you go from um, violet through indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. The longest wavelength is red, the shortest wavelength is blue. The highest frequency is, not blue, sorry, purple, and the lowest frequency is red. And you can extend this. We could have infrared up to radio waves, you could have UV up to gamma. Now, when a galaxy emits light from itself, which then travels to Earth, it will emit that light in a certain number of waves. And this is here going to be a stationary galaxy. So if this galaxy, relative to Earth, was stationary, and both the Earth and the galaxy were stationary, it's emitted some light. If the galaxy instead was moving towards the Earth, this way, the light it emits can't just be cut off, it can't just now emit two, bit, two waves of light. It's still going to have to emit three waves of light because I can't get rid of waves because if I get rid of waves and get rid of energy and that's not allowed. That light just has to be shunted up into a smaller space. It has to be sh um, squashed. So the wavelength decreases. Now when the wavelength of light decreases, it goes along this way on the spectrum. This is increasing wavelength, it goes that way. So red light would become orange, orange light would become yellow, yellow light would become green, green light would become blue, and so on. 
what we say is that the wave is shifted to the blue end of the spectrum and we call this blue shift. When a galaxy is moving towards us, the wavelength of the light is blue shifted. Now it doesn't mean the galaxy looks blue. A blue galaxy would then be blue shifted further and would look more purple. A purple galaxy, if they exist, would look more ultraviolet, but it will shift towards that blue end. An infrared um, wave would shift to red, so it's still, it, um, still be blue shifted, it just goes towards the blue side. However, if the galaxy is moving away from us, those, once again, the galaxy emits its light, we can't just make more waves to fit in this gap. The same number of waves have to fit in the same gap. So what we've done here is you can see that the wavelength has increased to make it fit, to stretch. The wavelength has been stretched, that light's been stretched. And if we increase wavelength, we go from whatever colour, let's say it's yellow light, it goes towards the red end of the spectrum. So a yellow light might look orange, an orange light might look red, and we call this redshift. And redshift can be applied to a red light, it would just turn infrared instead. And the more something is redshifted, the more it's moving away from us. Now redshift um, happens if galaxies are moving away from us, blue shift happens if galaxies are moving towards us. And the more something is redshifted, the more that galaxy is moving away from us. Um, and if the more it's blue shifted, the quicker it's moving towards us, the more it's moving towards us. Now, how do we know this? Okay, if I look at a galaxy, I can't look at it and say, well, that galaxy should be yellow. So the fact that I'm seeing it as red means it's redshifted because galaxies are different colours depending on their age. A new galaxy will be more blue and yellow. An older galaxy will have more red giants in it and therefore be redder. So we can't just look at the colour and say, well, it's more red than it should be. We use this. This here is um, an absorption spectra. So when light is emitted from a galaxy, it passes through a lot of gas and dust on its way to Earth. The same thing can happen if you are in a lab. If you have a light source and you make it pass through a certain gas, for example, helium, that's really common in the universe in space. Um, when you look at the light through a spectroscope, you will see something like this. If you look at normal light through a spectroscope, you will get a spectrum from um, violet to red or red to violet, whichever way around. If you have a light source, then a gas, and then you look through it, you'll get this. And this is an absorption spectrum. Some of the, some of the photons of light, some of the wavelength, have been absorbed by the gas. Now this would be the reference one in the lab. What you will notice, let's say this is for helium, because that's a gas that is all throughout the universe. Um, if you looked at light from a nearby galaxy, you would see the same spectrum, but you would see it shifted slightly over, like so. So you can tell it's the same spectrum because you've got the same pattern of lines, but the whole pattern has been shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. And this is where we really get the word redshift from. A distant galaxy would show that much more prominently. So you'd get more redshift. And the further away the galaxy was, the further over these patterns of lines would be shifted. Now we can use this to work out what the actual redshift of the uh, light is or of the galaxy is. Redshift is given the symbol Z and it has no unit. And there's quite a big equation that we can use. You can see there's lots of approximately equals in this equation. We can basically assume they're all equals for A level. So redshift is equal to the change in frequency over frequency. And what we mean here is the original or the lab frequency. And this is the change in frequency. Or it's equal to the change in wavelength over the original or lab wavelength. And this is equal to V over C, where V is the velocity of the object or galaxy and C is the velocity of the wave, or in this circumstance, light. So if we're thinking about redshift on a universe scale, we mean C is the velocity of light, so 3 times 10 to the 8, and then V would be the velocity of the object. If you're thinking about the Doppler effect, and maybe an ambulance, C would be the velocity of sound, and, and V would be the velocity of the ambulance. So just be careful, because we've got two wave speeds, they've used C there, but it doesn't always mean the speed of light. 
Now, how do you use this in real life? So if I think about my lab and my nearby galaxy, this is a scale of wavelength. It will go from about 400 to 700 nanometers. Um, yeah. And what you can do is you can measure the wavelength difference in light. Sorry, I had a bit of a thought pattern there. So if I look at one particular line, I'm going to look at this line here. And then this line is on this um, version is here. And I would work out, I would measure this and work out the change in lambda. Either I'd know what this lambda is and what this lambda is and find the difference, or I'd just measure the difference between there. And I would put that into my um, equation. The original lambda will be this one. So the original lambda goes there. And then if it was light, this would be 3 times 10 CA. And I can work out how fast that galaxy is moving away from me. It's quite a clever little method. Um, so why is this important? Well, somebody called Edwin Hubble used this to find out something pretty important about the universe. Hubble, I'm going to come back to this, sorry, looked at hundreds of galaxies quite nearby because he was working in the 1900s, like 1920s, and his telescope was very good for the time. It was not the Hubble Space Telescope. That's named after him, not because he used it. Um, but it was still 100 years ago and therefore couldn't see galaxies that were that far away. So he was looking at galaxies that are around about up to 500 megaparsecs away. And he noticed that 99.9% .9 of them were redshifted. And if 99.9% .9 of them were redshifted, that means that that many were moving away from us. He used this method, he worked out what the change in wavelength was and used the change in wavelength along with the speed of light in the original to work out, he used that redshift to work out the velocity of the object. And he plotted that velocity against the distance to the galaxy and he called this a recession velocity because these galaxies were pretty much all moving away from us. The only ones that are really moving towards us are some close by ones um, which aren't particularly uh, following the large scale rules of the universe because they're nearby. So he plotted a graph of recession velocity in kilometres per second versus the distance to the galaxy in megaparsecs, which is just a unit of distance that we use for astronomy quite a lot. And he found that the two are directly proportional. His data was not perfect, but there was a definite linear trend and it was definitely directly proportional. He found that the velocity, the recession velocity, was proportional to the distance of the galaxy. Now we can also write this, if we've got proportionality, as v equals a constant times d, and this constant we call h naught. And h naught is the gradient of the graph. And this value is called the Hubble constant. Now, the Hubble constant has got a really awkward um, unit because have a think about it, you're dividing kilometres per second by megaparsecs. So if you just use it straight off the graph, you get a Hubble constant in kilometres per second per megaparsec, which you know isn't, isn't the nicest. And Hubble got a value of approximately 500 kilometres per second per megaparsec, but now we have better values and the current Hubble constant is equal to 70 plus or minus 2 kilometers per second per megaparsec. It's quite a bit different to Hubble's 500 but we still got a bit of uncertainty there so why this uncertainty? Let me change colour pen. So why this plus or minus? Well it's really difficult to measure distances large distances in space and that will be covered in another video. So that means that there's quite a lot of uncertainty in this data here uh, and therefore if you've got uncertainty in this data you're going to have more scatter in your graph which means your gradient is going to be more uncertain. So they think it's around about that value here. There's been, it's been raging debate for hundreds of, not hundreds of years, we've only known about it for 100 years, for the past few decades. Now Hubble's law just to kind of reiterate and make it really obvious, Hubble's law is this, but that tells us that the recession velocity 
of a galaxy is proportional to its distance from Earth. And that leads us to quite an important finding. And just to give a bit of background to this, we're going to think about something called the cosmological principle. Now, the cosmological principle is that on a large scale, the universe is isotropic. That means it's the same in all directions. And it's homogeneous, which means it's the same in different places. So what does this mean? Well, if I look to the east or the west night sky, yes, there's different constellations, but they look generally the same. There's stars and it's dark. And if we took Earth and took it away from where it is now and placed it in a different galaxy and we looked up in the sky at night, yes, the constellations would look different, just like it looks different if you go to a different country or to a different hemisphere, but you'd still just have stars in the sky. And basically this means, quite sadly, that there is nothing special about the position of Earth. We're not in the centre of the universe. So if every galaxy is moving away from us, and the further away the galaxy is, the more the faster it's moving away from us, and there's nothing special about the Earth's location. That means that Hubble's discovery was actually pretty, pretty important, because Hubble's discovery tells us that the universe is expanding. If every galaxy is getting moving away from every other galaxy, because we're not special, it's not like they're all just moving away from Earth, they're all moving away from each other. The universe is expanding and actually what it is is that the fabric of space is expanding so think about imagine you're back in school if it wasn't covid times and your teacher asked you to stand up and then said right find the person nearest to you i want you to take a big step far away from them in the opposite direction to them as you stepped away from them yes you'd move away from them but you'd probably move closer to somebody else at the same time that isn't how the universe is expanding it's not like the galaxy is just moving away from each other a better thing to think about if you've got a balloon and you draw some dots on it, if you then blow the balloon up, every dot will have moved further away from every other dot. And that's kind of how the universe is. It's more like a surface. Now, if the universe is expanding, if we think backwards, what does that mean? So if the universe is getting bigger, that means that in the past it was smaller. And if I keep tracking back, In the past, the universe was smaller. I get that in the past it was at one point, and that leads to the idea of the Big Bang Theory. And this is not the only piece of evidence for the Big Bang Theory. There were other competing theories that also had expansion in them, such as the steady state, theory, steady state theory, but it's one idea for it, or one piece of evidence for it. And from this, if we've got the Big Bang Theory and the universe was smaller, we have this idea that the universe has a start or has an origin, therefore has a finite age. It's not existed forever. And that was quite a big deal um, a couple of decades, well, more than a couple, but in the 1900s, 1950s. Now, we can work out what the age of that universe is using Hubble's graph. That is something that you are going to have a look at in another video. Um, the Big Bang Theory in my um, A-level specification isn't a big thing to know about. I will quickly mention it now, uh, but if you want to have more detail about that, I've got some more in a GCSE video. But the Big Bang Theory isn't that the universe exploded, it isn't how the universe began. All it says is that in the distant past, the universe was hot and dense. Since then it has expanded, becoming less dense and cooler. So it doesn't tell us that there was an explosion, you can't explode or hear a bang at least if there is nothing to hear it in. Um, it doesn't actually tell us about the very moment the universe began, it just tells us how the universe has evolved since just after that. And it tells us that the universe has expanded and as it's expanded it's become less dense and it's been, been cooler. And that all comes out of Hubble's law, so a pretty important thing to know about. And without redshift we wouldn't be able to um, understand that or know that.
so quite a big theory to understand in cosmology.